Hi, Crafted Entrepreneurs. I'm joined by Brad Chandler in this episode. He's created massive success in the real estate arena, and I'm really excited for you to hear this episode because although he had created massive success, he wasn't always happy and he didn't have really thriving relationships. He talks about how he had two failed marriages and lost $9 million. So Brad and I dive into everything from what it felt like when he lost his happiness and why he doesn't drink alcohol to, you know, how he has a incredible empire that runs on him only working one hour a week. And he spends the rest of his time giving back and coaching others to really love themselves. So it's a really interesting conversation as, um, you know, I'm super spiritual and uh, very much a Christ follower. And so some of the things that he says, it's not necessarily like I agree with 100% of the things around self love, but I do love what he talked about when, you know, we're talking about being introspective and really being in alignment with going after your goals and not just doing things out of your ego. So I think you're going to enjoy this episode. Hello, Crafted Entrepreneurs. In this episode, I'm bringing you an awesome guy. I actually met him inside of this mastermind that I'm in with him. He's such a wealth of knowledge in business and in the coaching world. He talks a lot about what it takes to heal childhood trauma and find true freedom and happiness. Brad is a father, an entrepreneur, and a coach helping others find freedom and happiness. So I'm excited to bring on Brad Chandler. We're going to talk about lots of things today. So welcome, Brad, to the show. Oh, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Yay. Okay, so you basically built a real estate empire and found out you weren't happy. That's kind of like the the short the short version of the story, right? Can you kind of take us back to what made you get involved in real estate and then we'll talk about the moment you realized you weren't happy and what you did to change it? Sure, sure. So I read a book when I was in ninth grade on how to buy real estate with no money down. And I knew that I wanted to do real estate because I learned that there was unlimited income potential. And it wasn't until 17 years later that I started the business that I realized that I had gotten into real estate just to make a bunch of money because I didn't feel worthy. I didn't like myself. I didn't feel great about myself. And I thought that money was a way. That's how my dad showed me love was through money. And that's how he kind of gauged his worth was about how much money he was making. So that's what I was used to. That's what I was brought up with. So I thought if I make a bunch of money, I'll be really happy. And a couple of years ago, trying to get my son help for his anxiety, I went through and basically learned that um, it wasn't that I was necessarily unhappy. Is it it was I lacked self love and self compassion. And I had this inner voice speaking to me from my childhood, the way that my dad made me feel I didn't feel good enough. And those subconscious thoughts and beliefs that are buried deep in our bodies and minds control 95% of our daily behavior. So I, I looked at my outcomes and two failed marriages and the use of alcohol and weed. And I made five business mistakes, Kayla, that cost me $9 million trying to prove my worth. So I looked at all those things and I was like, oh my gosh, like I, um, I thought I had it all and I thought I was happy, but I really wasn't. Mm. Wow. There's like so much there. And I think a lot of people listening in right now can relate to, you know, just either the mother or the father. Like it was your, it was your dad in your case. And I think like every parent, they're always just doing the best they can. We usually just model and emulate what was modeled to us. And, you know, what's so cool about you is like you're, you're a generational curse breaker, right? So it's not going to be passed down to your kids. And I just want everybody listening in right now to really just think about that. Like, you know, having compassion towards yourself will help you have compassion towards your parents too. So you talked about your dad, right? What is he still in your life right now? He, no, he, unfortunately he passed away about five years ago. And had you had this realization, was that prior or? Unfortunately, it was after. And we, we spent four years of not talking before his death. So he died um, with, with us going silent for four years. It was the battle of two egos. And unfortunately, he, uh, he passed away. And before I was, you know, made my big profound shift because, of course, I would have reached out to him and talked to him and whatnot. But 
everything yeah. happens in reason for, uh, in life for a reason. And God has his plan. And, um, I just, at this point, I just, I've, one of the profound changes I've made is I just let everything happen to me. Like, you know, God's got a plan bigger than I ever know. And so I don't have any bad days anymore because no matter what happens, I'm like part of God's plan, part of the universe's plan. And it's teaching me something. I may not find out in this life. I may find out next life. or I may find out tomorrow or 10 years from now, but I just, there's nothing bad can happen to me anymore. Wow. Okay. I love that outlook of nothing bad can happen to you. And I really do believe that God has a plan like Romans eight twenty eight. like he uses everything good, you know, or everything that is happening to us for his good and for his glory. Right. So, okay. What did your life look like, right? When you have your son experiencing anxiety, what's going on in your mind at the time? Yeah. So I want to make a comment before I answer that. You mentioned the multi-generational curse. You speak my language. I love it. I think the greatest gift any parent can give their child is to break that multi-generational curse. You said my kids were exempt. Well, they live for most of their lives not being exempt because I was that guy fighting for my worst. So both of them had anxiety problems. They're way better now that I've spent two years transforming myself and trans my relationship with everyone in my in my life and world has transformed. So they weren't exempt, but they... If, if you have, if your kid right now has behavioral problems and you want to figure out where it's coming from, get your spouse and walk into the bathroom and look in the mirror because that's where the, that's where the issue usually comes from. So I'm in the process of changing that and it's changing in a big way. So back to your question about how did I feel? I was, um, my wife had walked out on me. My second wife had walked out on me in the middle of COVID. She woke up one day and said, I'm done with you. Those were her, ex her exact words. And I'd heard that too many times in the last two years. So I was just like, I can't keep fighting for this. I can't live in a marriage where every couple of months I'm, I'm threatened, you know, I'm done. So, um, she left seven days later, pulled up a moving truck when I was on vacation and cleared out most of the house. And I was really wow. sad for 45 days, really sad for 45 days. And then I went on this, like dating every woman that I could get, you know, that, that would date me and, and dating apps began my, um, that, that was a validation. If women will like me, if they'll hang out with me, then, you know, she didn't like me, but at the time I didn't feel great, but I, I thought I was happy. That's the thing. Like if, if you'd have asked me three years ago, Brad, do you have self-loving self-compassion? I've been like, yes. Do you care if people, you know, what people think of you? I'd be like, no, looking back, I didn't have self-love. I didn't have self-compassion and I did care about what people thought about me. And those things completely ruled my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's sometimes like, you know, the more self-awareness you have, the more you can transform, you know, over and over and over again. But a lot of people do have, you know, like a lack of self-awareness and everybody from the outside can probably see. I, I wonder if people in your life looking at it, did they realize like that you had a problem or what was that like? I mean, for, for the, the average person looking on at my Facebook post and, and seeing me know I had a successful business, I had a 42 foot boat, I had a luxury car, I had houses, I had a business that, you know, ran pretty well most of the time. So no, people just thought that I was on top of the world. Wow. Well, that's where it's like social media, the highlight reel, right? So, yep. okay. So you, you had this, you know, you were going on these dating sprees, your son, how old was he at the time having this amount of anxiety? Oh boy. So let's say it was, um, it was like three years ago, three years ago. Yeah. Three to four years ago. So how old was he? He was, uh, so he's getting ready to turn 21. So he was like 17. Wow. So he's really going through this like defining moment, like becoming an adult and he's experiencing anxiety. What made you go, okay, I want to help him. Like there's a fix to this because some, some parents, they just go, well, let's go get you on meds. Let's, you know, let's go make it better. We tried that route. I tried therapist after therapist. We put him on meds. He hated it. Um, was like, I've never taken those things again. I had a call um, that I can remember like it was yesterday with a friend of ours that runs in our same circles. You probably know him. And he's like, Brad, how's your life? And I'm like, dude, it's amazing with the exception of one thing. I was like, my son has severe anxiety. And he's like, well, I know someone that can help you. And that, that was a turning point. So I was like, look, I'll try anything. And so I reached out to these folks and um, in the process of reaching out to them, um, I was on the phone with a performance coach and she's like, you have a tick. You blink profusely when you talk about your childhood. You may have some unresolved childhood stress and trauma that's affecting your life, but also creating the anxiety for your son. I've been a single dad now for 12 years. And so mom, um, my son's mom and 
uh, she she had some major challenges in her life uh, over the years. So he kind of got hit from both sides. Hmm. Okay, so you had people speak into you, which that I really want to point that out right now because that's the the thing that you did have going for you is that you were willing to talk it out loud. I mean, most men would have been like, everything's going great. Everything's going great. But you were brave enough. And that was probably like the Holy Spirit in you that was just like nudging you like, hey, speak up because this person has something for you. So that's amazing. And, you know, you did a lot of things right to have those types of people in your life. So I don't want to like just say, you know, believe that your life was so messy, you know, because you were doing something right. So let's just point that out. And I think that's very important for people listening in right now. Like, who do you have in your life that you can have those real conversations with? And you said you were talking to a performance coach and it's like you had to invest in that. That wasn't free. Is that right? Well, yeah, that, I, I reached out to her in an initial conversation to see if she could help my son. Yep. So, but you're, you're like, I want help. I'm I'm willing to like say yes and raise a hand. And so you've got to be willing to do that. Like, and this isn't, you know, I think people listening in right now, they just think it's going to, somebody's going to walk up to them and want to help them, but you first have to raise your hand. But Kayla, I didn't know I needed help. I thought this was like, my son's issues had nothing to do with me. In fact, when we went from her to another, we went to this thing called brain camp and I called to, to ask about the cost and everything. And she's like, well, you're coming too. I'm like, I don't have the problem. She goes, why do you think your son has anxiety? And I'm like, oh, okay. It could be my fault. It could, it's, I don't like using the word fault. It's not my fault. It was just I did the best I could do. A single dad, I did everything for my kids and I continue to do everything for my kids. But when you're a parent and you feel unworthiness, you're you're affecting your kids 100% of the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, oh my gosh. I mean, I, I, I didn't even know we were going to talk about the kid thing, but I think this is like so important to, to hone in on when you said, go look in the mirror. Like if your kids are having issues, because- I see that. Like I always say, our kids are our medicine. So if my, one of my kids is struggling with something, I always go, okay, what was I struggling with at their age? And I try to go back and like heal those parts of me, but also try to see what am I bringing into the relationship that is making them feel insecure, making them question things, you know? Um, so I love that. I love that we're getting to talk about this because so many people think that it's other outward you know, things that are happening, but it's really like what's happening in the four walls of your home. So you became a single dad and what were, I mean, what was the process of still like being able to create an awesome business and take care of your kids really well? Like maybe not mentally at that or emotionally at that time, but like, you know, physically you were, you were providing for them. How did, how were you able to do that? Wow. And by the way, I love that. I've never heard that your kids are your medicine. My son was my medicine. My son helped change my life. And now he's helping change uh, hundreds and hopefully thousands and millions of lives through me. How was I able to do that? Um, I had a lot of support from my mom the first couple of years. And then I just made my kids a priority. I was always, I was always there for them, you know, getting them to the bus stop. I never missed any of their events at school. So I was definitely there. I, and I was, I'm a very loving and affectionate person. I just probably had a shorter temper. I probably, I know what I did with my son is my unworthiness pushed him inadvertently to become a world-class golfer. And he got a college scholarship and now hardly plays golf anymore. And he told me in the uh, intensive that I went through when I made this huge, huge change, he was like, dad, I, I only thought you would love me if I played golf really well. And of course I didn't say that. I, I told him countless times, if you don't like golf, you can quit. But my my feeling of unworthiness, it was just another thing that I thought, oh, if this outside thing happens in my life, if my son can become the uh, PGA Tour player, the world might see me as doing something good and worthy. So um, I just folk, I, I just my kids were a priority for the most part. And I always set up systems in my business so I didn't have to. I was always good about delegating and finding people to do things that I didn't want to do. Yeah, that's how, that's what gave you that time. And. That's amazing. I love that. I, as you're talking, I'm going, oh my gosh, because, you know, my son, he's 13 and he plays like super elite hockey and he thinks he's going to go to the NHL or whatever. And I hope he does, but it's, he, it's seven days a week and it's, it's a lot, you know, of pressure he puts on himself. And I'm always saying, you know, you could quit at any time. Like, I don't care if you play hockey. I'd rather you, I always tell him, please play golf because it's not a contact sport. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm like always begging him, please play golf. <laughs> so that just made me laugh because I'm thinking, oh my gosh. Um, but he, I already have him with, you know, like he goes to performance coaches and he's doing this brain tap thing. And I have him like working with so many different people to make sure that like he has a support system in place so that way he can always have like an outlet in case he wants to quit, but he's like scared to tell us. Anyway, so I think that's just important to point out to people too, is just like you as an adult need a support system, but your kids do too. And sometimes you can't like, you should be part of that support system, but like be thinking outwardly about, you know, who else you can bring into their lives to help them be the best version that they can be of themselves. So I, okay. I want to talk about the systems that you put in place because there's a lot of entrepreneurs listening in right now. And I want to get, we're going to get into the happiness stuff too, because we could just, I feel like me and you, we can geek out on that for <laughs> hours and hours, days and days. Okay. On that yep. stuff. But people are going, okay, what were the systems? Because I currently miss a lot of stuff that my kids have and I don't want to miss it. So what were some systems that these people can put into play? So I, I mean, one of the first books I ever read when I launched my business was The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. And it's basically, it, if you're going to open up a, a restaurant or a business, open it up like you're going to do it 5,000 times. So anytime I ever did anything in my business from, from early on, I'm thinking, how can we systematize this? How can we process this? How can we make a process out of it so that we can do it a thousand times? And if I leave, someone else could come in and do it. So I focused on that. I think one th really important thing that you just said that people often overlook is I don't have time for my kids. I don't have time for my spouse because I'm working so much. Work is often an addiction. And addictions always come from I'm not enough. So I've worked with several clients that make a shitload of money and don't need to make any more money, but they work all the time because they've got that little voice buried deep inside their subconscious mind because their parents made them feel that way. I'm not enough. So I got to keep work, 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 work. So if you're, if you're sitting there and you're like, I don't have time for my kids, is it a systems problem or is it a thinking problem? I think that 99% of every problem that you have right now comes down to a thinking problem. So start exploring that in your life before you think that you might have poor systems or lack of systems. Whoa, mic drop. I think that's so good. So, so good. And I have never heard of the e-myth. So now I want to go buy that book. I feel like there's a theme with you, Brad. You read a book and then you apply. <laughs> You've read a book, <laughs> learning how to do real estate with other people's money. Then you do the e-myth. And, um, I think a lot of people, they, they have short term thinking, right? So they don't look at, oh, I need a standard operating procedure for this thing in my business that I'm doing for the first time. It's like build it now. And then it's easier next time, you know, having to teach somebody or onboard somebody. So that just goes in, you know, with your thinking, it's like, okay, yeah, if we just had a long-term thinking about our business and if we also had long-term thinking about, um, you know, just right now, the story of I don't have time. Do you want that to be your story for the long-term? Do, do you really think you're going to be winning at life if you still don't have time 20 years from now? And if you don't do something different today, that's going to be your story 20 years from now. So yeah. you have to choose new thinking. I don't think I'm alone. Um, when I look back at my business and I started to make money to prove my worth, I think a, launch, a lot of entrepreneurs fall into that bucket. And I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs fall into the bucket of control. They lack control in their life through, the, through those stressful situations where they couldn't control things. Their mother and dad were fighting about money all the time. And they're like, I'm going to start a business in control. Well, you really don't control anything in life, but you're thinking. You actually get control in life by giving up control. And you know, like I was speaking about earlier, Nothing bad happens to me because I've given up control to God in the universe. Whatever happens to me, it's happening for a reason. So I just take and say, okay, let's see what the lesson I learned and I move on. Mm -hmm. You know what? You And you just did a reel uh, on this on Instagram, right? Where you talked about how so many entrepreneurs tie their worthiness into how much money they make and, and their net worth. And, you know, I just went through a rebrand because that was the whole reason why I created my um my company, Mommy Millionaire, was because I was so tied in to this whole thing of making millions. And if I didn't make millions a year, then something was wrong with me. And um, it, I felt so much pressure all the time. And it was affecting, like, I was literally getting depressed because I was so stressed out about me. I had to make more and more money year after year after year to, like, prove to people that I could do it. And, um, and then I realized, like, after I had the epiphany of, okay, self-worth isn't tied to how much money I'm making. But if I don't rebrand and start talking about something different, 
I'm going to cause this problem with other people. Like, and other people think they have to make millions. And so I was like, we have to stop talking about millions because it's just, it's not, your happiness cannot be tied to how much money you're making, how much number, you know, how many zeros are in your bank account. Uh, there's so much more to happiness. It's, you know what I mean? So I love that you're putting out so much good to- content around that. Tell me about the story where you lost $9 million. Like what the heck, like, how do you lose $9 million? I was like imagining this in my head. What are all the oh. ways you could lose $9 million? So it was five mistakes, right? One was renovating 80 houses in one at one given time. I didn't buy all 80 houses at one time, like from one owner. But over time, we had 80 renovation projects stretching from uh, Frederick, Maryland to Fredericksburg, Virginia, which is like a four to six hour car ride, depending on traffic. Okay. So that cost us, when we look back, that probably cost us millions of dollars. I started Keller Williams team in 2008. And guess what my goal was to become the first agent team ever to sell a billion with a B dollars of real estate in one year. Well, why do you think I did that? I didn't know at the time, but worthiness, if I could sell a billion dollars, I might be worth something. We lost a million dollars there. I got involved in a trademark lawsuit that cost us $1.9 million. Probably a lot of it was about my ego. We bought a house in North Arlington where we thought we could knock it down, subdivide it and put two houses up. Someone could have told us by running a title search in 15 minutes that, hey, it's a corner lot there, young man. You can't subdivide it. So that house and two other development deals we bought in the summer of 2005, we lost $3 million combined on those two houses. The the one house that I just spoke about in North Arlington, we lost $924,000. And guess what? We didn't have a personal guarantee on the loan. We could have walked away, but we didn't because that wouldn't be the right thing to do. They let us structure a payoff over two years and they reduced the interest rate a little bit. 20 years later, those two brothers have are the, are the, have invested more money in Express Home Buyers than anyone else. So we borrowed in return like in excess of $200 million with those guys. Wow. That's okay. Yeah. You went through those five mistakes rather quickly. I was like, I'm still catching up to all of them right now. <laughs> because I don't, I, I just want to get through them and move on. No, yeah. Right. Kidding. We I, don't like I've, to talk I've, about the mistakes. <laughs> I've moved on. Actually, I love talking. I mean, I have no problem talking about them. Just like I said, everything happens to, to me. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's happening for me. So not to me, everything's happening for me. So I'm okay with them now. Yeah. Well, and now you're teaching people, right? So what were the things that you would have done differently, right? So in all of those things, it was real estate things. So you're saying in the first mistake, the the properties were spread out four to six hours apart. Would you have just stayed all in one location? Would you have not taken on as many projects at one time? I mean, as much as I say we systematize our business, I don't think we did a good job of systematizing the construction end of it. We didn't have the right people. Um, we did way too much. Construction is the hardest part of the fix and flip business. Yep. But with it, like a, by a factor of 10x. And renovating five houses as opposed to one isn't five times harder. It's like 25 times harder. But if you look at the common theme, Kayla, among all of those things, you're like, what would you advise someone to do? I'd advise someone to learn who they are. I would advise someone to every single day of their life, ask themselves, why am I coming home drinking three glasses of wine? Why am I yelling at my wife? Why, when my wife says something, do I stop talking to her for two days? Why do I have to go open a new market like me in Virginia Beach when I couldn't even keep brochure boxes filled in my in my market? If I had done all those things and been more introspective and been more aware, because like you said earlier, all change begins with awareness, I could have been like, why do I have to go to Virginia Beach when I don't even have stuff running here? Does this have something to do with my ego? If I go to Virginia Beach and pr- am I trying to prove something? That would have changed everything. Yeah. Wow. That that gives me chills just thinking about that because so many people, we do do things out of ego. And I say e- ego stands for edging God out. And it's when we, you know, we're making it all about us and our story. When if you just get quiet and say like, you know, I like to run everything by, by God and absolutely everything I do is there, is this a yes or a no? And if I feel like God's telling me yes, then I go to the Bible and I'm like, okay, where in scripture can I find proof for this? And then I also pray and ask God, please like, give me a sign from people that are wiser than me. If it's a yes, like if it's a confirmed yes, I'm going to get a yes from somebody in my circle. Right. So I love, love, love that advice of being introspective, but also having those people in your life too, that can hold you accountable too. Cause 
Had you had a mentor in your life, maybe they would have said, hey, Brad, slow it on down, buddy. <laughs> oh, I did. I, I, I just didn't listen to him because, <laughs> because I, could, I couldn't. Like this was, this is, I mean, you yeah. know this stuff. This is like survival, right? Yeah. I was in a survival state because I hadn't processed my trauma. So I was a six-year-old kid trying to survive. And so I had to do these things. People told me, hey, you're going way too fast. I'm like, I'm smarter than you. I, I can do this. Like the first five months of 2005, I made a million and a half dollars net. I didn't know what I was doing, but I thought I did. And that's when I bought the three development deals that cost me $3 million and took 10 years to extract from one of them. Whoa. 10 years Jesus. of misery we dealt with. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and now you can laugh about it. And now you can, and laugh, now I can about laugh about it. it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you know, so I think that mistakes you know, they, they do shape us and make us into who we are. And I've made countless, countless mistakes, you know, and now I try to like learn and make lessons out of all of those because, um, you know, we've get, been given platforms. So it's like, I want to give it back to people so that way they don't make the same mistakes. So I'm so grateful that you're willing to share that. So you're saying in order to avoid making those mistakes, be introspective. But you also said another thing about um, construction. And, you know, I talk about this too inside of my crafted deals program because it's, it's, you know, people say the hardest thing is to find a deal. But yeah, what happens after you find the deal? You have to know how to build out a construction crew. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because there's a lot of people listening in right now that are interested in flipping. And I think there are some do's and don'ts when it comes to building out a crew. Can you kind of share some? Yeah. So here's the thing. I can't tell you how many times we've made this mistake. We give a con we find a new contractor. We give them a house. The contractor does an amazing job. We're like, oh my God, we've got our contractor. And so what do we do? We give him three houses and then boom, he blows up, moves to Guatemala, runs away with our last $40,000. And we're like, wait, he was so good. He was so good. He was really good at one house, not freaking three houses. So the best thing that you could do is once you identify a contractor, just because they do one house doesn't mean they can do three more. Give them one house, one house, one house, see them through, and then give them one house and maybe a month later, give them two or give them another one so it overlaps a little bit. Just go slowly. But again, when you've got these, the, I've got to survive and make a lot of money, you, you all that goes out. Reasoning goes out because logic is always trumped by emotion. My emotion was, you better freaking renovate more houses, dude. You got to make more money to prove your worth. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. That is so good, especially because there's a lot of women listening in right now. And I feel like, I don't know what it is, but I, I have it where I just like, I, I'm really like, oh, I want to believe the best in people. And you did so good at this. So now I, I want to give you more. I want to help you out, buddy. You know? So I love that thing because it's like, you know, you can trust that person to a certain extent. But um, I think, was there a gut factor? Like, so obviously, did you lose $40,000? A contractor went to Guatemala. Is that a true story? Oh, it's happened multiple times. But, yeah. but recently, we, I hired a guy um, that I, from my marina. And he was just such a nice dude. And he did a great job on the first one. So we gave him a couple of projects. And then, boom, it blew up. Oh, man. And we, and it, Were and there it, any red up, flags? I don't think so. I don't, I don't not, I'm not intimately involved in the construction process. So it wouldn't be fair to ask me. I know with me, certainly from like, I thought this guy was just an amazing human being. And then he, it, it, yeah, things turned. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh man. All right. So, you know, always give one house at a time. I really like that. Now, if you were to set both mindset and strategy on a scale when it comes to growing your business, right? Which do you think is more important to focus your time and money on in investing? I don't like the word mindset because mindset is the, is the, I love Tony Robbins and he's an amazing individual. The Zig Ziglar's and the Tony Robbins remind me of mindset. And to me, mindset is, oh, you want to meet with a seller and you're scared to open the, or pick up the phone. Just say affirmations over and over again. You can search mindset. Mindset doesn't work. That's why traditional talk therapy usually doesn't work is because they're focused on the conscious mind. Mindset is way deeper and it's those subconscious thoughts that, that, that drive 95% of our behavior. So mindset or strategy, here's the thing, Kayla, someone could have given me like, uh, Accenture could have given me a strategy for how do I get express home buyers into 30 markets in, in 
two years. I'm just making up something. My flawed thinking would have torpedoed that. It would have it would have either gone too fast to prove my worth, or I think there was in in my case and a lot of people's cases, I think I sabotaged myself when I started making millions. I was like, I don't deserve this. I'm not good enough. So it's this really weird dichotomy of I want to make a lot of money to to prove my worth, but when I start to make a lot of money, you don't really deserve it. And I think that's what my nine million dollars of mistakes was. It was like a thermometer. I did drop back into the comfortable zone. So I, knowing what I know now, would say that. Your, the way you think about yourself and see the world is way more important than any strategy because you could have the greatest strategy and you could screw it up if your mindset's, if your mindset's wrong. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Let's talk about spirituality, okay? How important is it for you to have a spiritual practice for your happiness? Because, you know, there are the things that we can do, but ultimately, like, like you said earlier in the podcast, we really don't have any control except for what we're thinking. And like, for me, that's like talking to God every single day, like learning about God's character. And then it helps me, you know, try to be in alignment with like God's way of thinking and being in this world. So what does your spiritual practice look like? So I um, grew up Catholic, uh, switched to Episcopal church. And then about three years ago, a guy in real estate who does all of our sales said, Hey, why don't you come to my Bible based church in Chantilly? So I've been doing that. Um, I really enjoy it. We go and sing uh, three songs and I'm, out, I'm singing as loud as I can. I've got the words up there. It's like karaoke day. And then we actually talk about the Bible and how it relates to real world. So um, that uh, I pray every night. Um, I, I say my Our Father every night. And I do, um, I usually ask people what their, what their faith is. And for the people who say I'm a believer, I talk about God a fair amount. Um, and, and candidly for the ones who don't, I don't push it. Um, and I struggle with that. I think you and I talked about this offline. Um, maybe I should be doing more of that, um, but that's where I'm at. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's say like right now uh, you are bringing on, you're still in real estate. Is that right? So I spend about an hour a week in my real estate business. We did 256 uh, uh, houses last year, but fortunately I'm in a good place. Okay. So let we have to talk about that. Like, how did you get to that? Obviously you have a great team. Yep. How, so how did you bring stellar talent onto your team? So that way you could spend an hour a week. That's amazing. It took a long time and I made a lot of mistakes. And mm-hmm. it wasn't until I made that mindset shift two and a half years ago where I went from, I've got to make a bunch of money to prove my worth to, you know what? I don't need to make a bunch of money to prove my worth because I know I'm worthy. Um, mm-hmm. God made me in, in his image. And so I know I'm worthy to, I want to make an impact in this world now. I just turned 50 last Saturday. I'm going to live to be 110. And for the next 60 years, I want to share my light and my love with others who are struggling. So literally, when I shifted from from money to, to impact, I attracted a different type, type of person. And then yeah. with, with, my, with, my, with my unworthiness feelings, what I did is I went out and hired a number of CEOs that I talk about red flags. We hired CEOs and COOs that there were a lot of red flags and I overlooked them because I was like, no, this guy's going to make me make me a ton of money. So I stopped overlooking those things. I, I really look for like quality people who were not about making a gazillion dollars, um, but it took me a long time. I can't I can't sit here and say like I'm amazing at spotting talent because I, I, I wasn't. Yeah, but I love that the correlation there is that when you changed where you got your worth from, you attracted in different people because you attract in who you are, right? So if you're attracting a bunch of insecure people, you're not going to have a stellar team. When you start to attract in people who are secure, they know who they are, they know the value they bring to the table, they show up and they give excellence every single day, which is amazing, you know? And I started coaching the people in my organization. I started saying, "What? Let, let's talk about your personal life. What's going wrong? How can I help you?" And yes. that 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 didn't hurt either. That is something that I t- constantly t- teach on, and I coach inside of my organization because it's called coaching up. Like I want everybody on my team to be better than me, and like everybody has blind spots, and so that's where I can help people grow inside of my organization is pointing out their blind spots and coaching them, coaching them forward. So I love that you're doing that. That's absolutely amazing. Okay. So we got that running. It's like rinse and repeat over there doing 256 homes last year. And you're, you have this coaching business that you're super excited about. So what makes your coaching different than, you know, every other manifestation coach and self-love coach out there? 
Well, so a couple of things I'll touch on. I re really haven't given a lot of thought to that, but what comes to mind is that I walk my talk. Um, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I have, I test every 90 days for 83 health markers, lab, lab, lab reports. I've got 78 in the ideal range. And then the five that aren't are borderline ideal. Um, I have a great relationship with my children now. I have a fantastic intimate relationship with someone I've been dating for seven months now. I have a business that runs on my own. So I've gone from where I've gone from the suffering to the self-love. So I have that. Um, but what my, my magic sauce is, and it's, it's just, what did I do? I went and found, I got trained by some of uh, who I think are the best in the world. I use a combination of NLP, neuro linguistic programming, CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy and hypnosis. And the hypnosis really allows me to go to the subconscious mind that knows the source of all of your problems. And we uncover those and figure out what was the meaning that you told yourself as a child. And then we reverse those stories and through neuroplasticity, which is a fancy word of saying your brain's natural ability to regrow new neural pathways. We tell yourself a better story so you can change your thinking and thus radically change your behavior. Okay. Obsessed. Love it. It's kind of a version of what I do with um, my coaching. I know we kind of talked about that offline. I do a ton of inner child stuff. And the thing that I think is really cool and unique about you, just to plug you here, is that he has built an extremely successful business. And I, there's so many people, like, it's easy to, like, um, I think, love yourself if you you know, you haven't made a lot of mistakes. I, I really think it is because it's like, you don't have as much shame, but like you've released all the shame out of your life that you could carry right from all of the, all of the stuff, right. From the past, you've gotten rid of that. Um, and you actually are like, you, you've done it. You've done it all. You've done what most people would be dying to do. So you're like, yeah, I've done all that. And this is the most important thing I want to be talking about and coaching on is the self-love and compassion piece. And for those of you that aren't watching on YouTube, he's wearing a shirt right now that says, no one can love you like you can. Is it? Is there a happy face on? <laughs> he's got a happy face. Okay. I love it. He, uh, he's got a happy face on his shirt. I was the president of the happy face club when I was nine years old. I started it. <laughs> I wanted more people to be nice to each other. So I'm a huge fan of happy faces. So you know, that's what makes you unique, right? Is that like, you're still saying like, here, let's, let's go inward and heal. Um, because you can't, you can't give to others what you can't give to yourself. And so if you really want to experience happiness and joy in this world, it, it's from connection. And so if you're disconnected from yourself, you're going to constantly be chasing, be striving and find you're never going to have that spirit of joy in your life. So I love what you're doing out there. I got to talk about the, the not drinking and, um, would you say smoking weed thing? So there's a lot of people that dr I don't drink either. And it makes people feel extremely uncomfortable. Like I even found out that mastermind that we were at together, like people think it's weird when you don't drink. And so you went from drinking a lot to then now it's like, you don't even crave it. Right because your health is more important. What are some other reasons why you don't drink? So alcohol is the only drug in the world that you have to justify why you don't use it. I know, I know. Which is, yeah. which is silly. Um, I stopped drinking when I, I mentioned brain camp earlier. I went to brain camp and they gave us this high dose of uh, superfood basically. And that was to get your, your gut, your good gut bacteria healthy. Your good gut bacteria is absolutely essential for good neural health. It's your second brain. I know most people don't realize that. So they were like, well, you can, you can go drink, but you're just going to kill your good gut bacteria and it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to mess up your brain, right? So I was like, I'll take a break. And that, that break turned into years, right? So I don't drink because um, there's a couple of great books. Huberman has an amazing podcast on alcohol and its effect on the brain and body. And then uh, This Naked Mind by Annie Grace. Um, it's a poison that that's basically it. And it's a depressant and I don't need a depressant. Um, I I'm as happy as can be. So why am I going to put a depressant in my body? And I want to live to be 110 so that I can continue to do this work forever. So that's mm. why I choose not to drink. I love that. It's a, it's an empowering choice and it's not for everybody. I mean, you have these long life goals, right? We got to also talk about this health factor, uh, where you get these tests done every three months. I think that's amazing. I actually just got like all of my labs checked, but I don't do it as often as you, but, 
I love it. So who do you, like, what is it called? What is, what is the test called that you're getting done every three months and why should we get that done? So Tony Robbins had a book that came out about a year ago called Life Force. And one of my clients sent it book. to me and I read it and it was phenomenal. Like I said, Tony Robbins is, I love that dude. He's one of, he's one of my, uh, one of my idols. Um, he's just so, so smart on so many things. Why do I do it? It's, it's a preventative thing. In the book, it talks about stage four cancer has a like a 90% failure or death rate. Stage one cancer has like a 90% of, uh, success rate, like cure rate. So I always want to know where I stand and I'm trying really hard to get those five markers into the ideal range so that I can have all 83 of my markers in an ideal range. Why should someone do it? Because you have no idea the impact on your neural health, anxiety, depression. So many factors in your life can be because of what's going on in your body. And if you go to a, a yearly physical where they only run probably 40 lab markers, you're really doing yourself a disservice. So I go to Life Force. I'm actually gonna be bringing that into my business. I'm gonna have my own thing hopefully in the next year. Um, but I go through Life Force right now that for every, it's only like a hundred bucks a month and you get uh, four lab results for every three months. And then you get to meet with a doctor for 15 minutes and they give you this amazing report that actually shows you the breakdown. And then the doctor talks, you, talks through it with you. That's awesome. So when you're working on these five markers, does it look like your diet? Is it exercise? Like what are you doing to help change those markers? So supplements, um, okay. different exercise routines, like lowering cardio, increasing cardio, diet and exercise. I mean, that's it. What type of diet do you follow? Uh, no carb, uh, no sugar. I, I pretty much have cut that all out unless I'm celebrating my 50th birthday in Jamaica where I just eat, eat, and eat, and eat. Um, normally 90% of my life, 95%, I just eat. I, so I fast, I do intermittent fasting. I do a shake mm -hmm. at, at about 12 o'clock, which is, um, it's uh pea protein. It's chocolate pea protein, no additives at all. No, no sugar, anything like that. I put in uh, mushrooms, uh, broccoli sprouts, which is one of the best anti-cancer things in the world. I, put I in, eat those uh, every day. Yep. Co collagen. And the last one is, um, I forget it. It's fiber, fiber. And so okay. I drink that at one and it's only about 300, 12 to one. It's only about 300 calories. And then at dinner, I eat a meat with, I love Japanese sweet potatoes and like a, a mix of vegetables, like, um, broccoli and cauliflower. So yeah. In a typical day, I'm only consuming about 1600 calories probably. And I work out six days a week, fairly hard. I don't kill myself, but. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I love that. It's so interesting because I feel like there is, so do you follow Dave Asprey, but the bullet, I'm assuming the I don't follow him, but I know of him. I've heard of him. Yep. Okay. Bulletproof coffee. Okay. Well, cause he's huge into just biohacking and the brain health and all of that kind of stuff. And I think that most people I've went to, um, a doctor that works closely with Tony Robbins. And he was like, you have to, you know, eat mainly like meats, like red meat. And I'm like, what? Like, this is the first <laughs> time somebody's told me you need to eat more red meat. I'm like what in the world? But I found, he did this test on me and it's like where you find out if you methylate or not. And I found uh, most high achievers don't. So you probably take the methylation supplement. Do you? I do. I do. Yeah. But, I, but, but, I, but in the last couple of months, it's gotten into the range where they're like, you can stop taking it now. Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah. Okay. I need to go get this. I'm excited. I want to go sign up for this. Uh, yeah, that's exciting. And then have you ever done any like stem cells or anything like that for rejuvenation? I haven't. Nope. Yeah. Cause he talks about that a lot in the book too. So Anyways, I'm super into stem cells right now. So that's exciting. I love that. I love talking about health because health is so important. Like if you don't feel good in your body, you know, it's really hard to just like be out there, like living your best life. So taking care of your temple is so, so important. I highly recommend everybody listening, read Life Force. It's such a good book. Okay. So because I feel like you're such a, you're, you're so into all the books and all the things, what are um, maybe three books that you're like, these are must haves. You've got to read them right now. Go on Amazon and order them. I've read 45 books since February of 2021. Um, the way to love stands above all of them. It's a, it's a mix of kind of Eastern and, and Western religion. Uh, it just, it's literally how, how to love yourself and how to just have an amazing life. It's a little tiny book. That's number one. Uh, number two is radical acceptance. Um, by Tara Brock. And then I'm going to throw in a business book for you. Cause I know you're like, Brad, stop on the happiness stuff. <laughs> um, 
Ray Dahlia Principles is probably one of the better books out there. I love that book. Okay, cool. I'll have to pick up the other two and check them out as well. I do love, um, did you read his new book, The World Order? I haven't, no. Yeah, it's good. That sounds scary to me. I try to stay in my happy <laughs> bubble. I don't. I, I stopped watching the news two years ago, two and a half years ago, and I used to be a news buff, and it was one of the better things I ever did because you can't control it, and it's just negative, 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 negative. So I, I hardly know what's going on unless I go to post something online and something pops up. I, I, and I love it that way. Yeah, absolutely. People say, well, don't you need to know like what is current? And I'm like, no, I don't. I need to know what's current in my life, but I don't really need to know what's going on in the world. I don't plan for on being a politician or anything like that. So I'm good. I'm just going to be happy. And yeah, so that's interesting. What do you do? Actually, this is a good question. What do you do when you have people in your life that are obsessed with the news and just kind of like fear mongering. Cause I know I have people in my family, not my immediate family, but you know, that want to send me stuff. And I'm like, thank you, but no, thank you. Don't stop I, sending me this stuff. That's it. I just tell them. And, and then when they t start talking, I just try to change the subject to something positive. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're really good at that. <laughs> that's a skill that you got. All right. Well, I'm excited. You, you've got the self love quiz that you've created, how can everybody find it? Bradchandler.com forward slash love. And it's vital because if you score, you can either score extreme self-love or mild self-love or lack of self-love. If you score one of the bottom two, two things, number one, your life is definitely impacted in every single area of your life and not in a good way, in a negative way. But number two, if you get one of those lower things, don't take it as woe is me. Take it as, oh my gosh, my life can get so much better. And my mm. relationships with my spouse and my kids and myself and my business and your health, everything will get better when you do the work to go from uh, lack of self-love to extreme self-love. Wow. I love that. I love that outlook on everything. We talked about so many good things today. What is one, what is one last thing you want to leave all of our entrepreneurs as they go out there and build their business today? I think that uh, it's really impossible or near impossible to suffer if you live in the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is that you are good enough and you weren't put on this earth to suffer. Uh, you were put on this earth to be joyous and be happy and have these amazing relationships with loved ones and, and thrive. We weren't, we weren't put here to struggle. And if you're struggling, you don't have to, there's a better way. Mm, so good. All right. Well, you guys take a screenshot of this episode, tag both me and Brad on social media and, you know, DM us if you have any questions about the episode. I'm sure a lot of you guys are going to love what Brad had to say. You guys can check out all of his coaching opportunities as well. And again, Brad, thank you so much for being on the show. I loved um, that we could talk about all of the things. It was such a fun conversation from health to wealth to, you know, parenting. It's absolutely amazing what you're doing in the world. And I'm really excited. Hopefully I live uh, for a very long time too, having as much impact as you. You're really inspiring. Oh, thank you so much.